Good day, my lovely listeners. You are listening to the Forty Orty Podcast. Tune in every week to explore inspiring stories and insightful information that dive headfirst into the world of autism and mental health. With all those tantalizing tongue twisters out of the way, let's get into the show. Hello, and welcome to the first 40 Orty podcast. Today I'm joined by Guy Shahar, the author of Transforming Autism How One Boy's Life Was Renewed and the creator of the Transforming Autism Project. Guy, say hello. Hello, Thomas. Uh, So just to give everyone a little bit of background, Guy went through a bit of a journey when his son Daniel was diagnosed on the autism spectrum. In the book, he talks about the development of Daniel's autistic traits, the difficulties in finding effective mainstream treatment, and the transformation that occurred in Daniel after their decision to go to the Mifni Center in Israel. So do you want to give a little bit of an intro into what the book is about and what the Mifni Center is about, just to give a bit more of an in-depth? Yeah, so the book is about basically about my son Daniel's life up to the age of about six, which is when, you know, he, at the age of one, we started to notice that there were some things about him that were changing and that worried us quite a lot because it looked like he was having a much less happy life and he was much less connected. So it's about the process that we went through to find out what was going on and try to get help for him. And that included going to this center that you mentioned called the Mifni Center in Israel, which is a specialist center for very, very young autistic children. It now only treats children up to the age of two. Daniel was slightly older than two when we went at that time. But yeah, that's, that's what it is. And it treats children in a, in a very different way from a lot of the other treatments that are available out there in that it's not about trying to mold the child according to expectations that we have of them and of how they should be. But it's about developing a relationship with the child and providing a safe environment around them so that they can bring out the best in themselves. Brilliant. Uh, So that that leads us on nicely into the the first question, which was, what were the early signs of autism that first appeared in Daniel? You know, what were the the main things that you guys picked up on and, you know, thought, Mm. hey, that's a little bit odd, a little bit strange, a little bit unique? The the first sign of all was... Uh, was was just that he started to chew his food and then let it fall out of his mouth. So he was swallowing less and less of it. That was the very first thing. That was just after he turned one. And we just thought, well, that's a bit strange. We didn't know anything about it. you know. And, and eventually it progressed so that he wasn't able to eat solid food at all by himself anymore. And he went back to having, we had to puree everything and, and feed it to him in front of cartoons. Um, but that was the very first thing. After that, you know, slowly, slowly, he started to withdraw and disconnect from us over a, over a period of months or so that, you know, he, he became less responsive to our attempts to communicate with him to the point where at, at one stage he didn't seem to register his name and didn't seem to want to hear his name in that he might sort of almost do a pushing away gesture and a groan when, when his name was mentioned. Uh, but the, the most difficult thing for all of us was that he became really, really frustrated really easily. And he had huge meltdowns that went on for hours sometimes and totally drained him. He sort of cried himself to sleep. I mean, it was more than crying. It was like sort of screaming and shaking and just being totally unconsolable. And then he'd wake up totally exhausted. Sometimes it would just resume there and then. And, you know, so he was totally depleting himself and his energy and everything and we had no idea what we could do to help him so it, it, it sort of went from that just starting to to spit out his food to that whole meltdown thing within about six months or so very soon and uh, mm. i think one of the problems with the the uk medical medical system in terms of autism is that they don't provide very early treatment it's very much uh 
sort of a late late stage thing. Yeah, I'm often, I mean, it's a common experience. We went there, we were told, wait and see, come back in a couple of years um, if, mm. if you're still concerned about something. And we were thinking, yeah, but we have this issue now. He's really yeah. struggling now. <laughs> what, what is waiting a couple of years going to achieve? Indeed. And it obviously, from what you've described, it's, it seems to be quite seemed to be quite a glaring issue and you you did say that you didn't have any prior knowledge of autism you and your your wife at the time so obviously there's got you 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 need to find some way to help your son out yeah yeah absolutely i mean we had we i i actually had more knowledge than i thought at the time because um last year it was confirmed that i'm autistic myself which i didn't know about so i didn't have the 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 knowledge in, in in the sense that it wasn't forefront in my mind but i had the experience and and you know a lot of things that have subsequently happened in daniel's life have mirrored a lot of the things that happened in my life and in my childhood as well oh well um welcome to the team <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> to the little autism community that's that's quite a big thing a very big thing mm. uh but i suppose that having that experience yourself it's going to be very beneficial to you know bringing up daniel because you'll obviously have a bit more of an understanding about all the difficulties that he'll be experiencing in life i think it does and i think it does on the level of almost being able to tune into him more easily and and have a sense of what he needs at any moment to feel better Mm -hmm. in the book you go into a lot of detail about how difficult the experience of getting support was you've you've touched on a little bit about how it was you know hard to get lower age sort of di- uh, diagnosis and treatment but what was your experience you know going about and talking to doctors and trying to get treatment um <laughs> not good to be honest and i don't know i th- i think part of the issue is that Autism is defined in medical terms by what they see as symptoms that indicate autism. So things like, um, you know, communication issues and things like this, they would define it by. And it doesn't seem to offer any route to understanding what it's about, to understanding the experience of the child that's going through what they're going through. And it doesn't seem to give, therefore, any clear path to helping those children and so even when you know there are some parents who find that the health system in their area or the particular people they interact with it is more responsive but what's it more responsive in doing it's more responsive in diagnosing and that's it that the, the, there isn't the real support and the real intervention to help the child even with the smaller pieces like like the anxiety and, and things like this so, um, so yeah, the, I mean, the book has um, a chapter of, uh, of horror stories, if people are interested in that sort of thing, uh, about trying to, to, to get some sort of meaningful help from the medical system. But, but it, at the end of the day, in our case, it ended up as quite a good thing that we didn't because that forced us to take responsibility ourselves for helping him and, and finding, finding a way that, that could make him feel better and, and happier. Yeah, I, I, I definitely, I completely get the the difficulty with the the medical system. My, my mum, uh, used to be a like special needs coordinator, and she's dealt with you know a lot of kids and stuff. She goes on like di- goes to different schools, does outreach, and um talks to the teachers and gives parents training, and she ha- is just astounded at just the Firstly, the lack of support in general medical systems. So although not everybody is an autism specialist, there is a very low understanding of how to how to go about that stuff. And I think one of the problems that you had was in those those settings when they're when they're trying to get the diagnosis or they're trying to do some kind of treatment, they're very they were very sort of not understanding of what it was like for Daniel. Yes. Would you agree? Yes. I, I also, I mean, I don't think there's, I don't think they have a lot of expectations of what they're able to do as well. 
you know, there's a they see autism as a condition that involves these symptoms, they call them, and, and it, once these symptoms are manifest, they're there for life, there's nothing you can do, you can trim around the edges and things like this. And so there isn't there isn't any real attempt because they don't think it's possible to really help the child become themselves, become who they are, become happier with who they are and how they are with themselves. Do you, do you see what I mean? Yeah, definitely. And I, I just, I, I am astounded myself at just how how li- little autism awareness, general autism awareness and specialism there is. Even, even for adults, you know, young adults, there is a large gap, you know, considering like the mental health issues in autistics, you know, one in one in three having severe mental health conditions, not a lot of, you know, like mental health professionals have autism training. And it just seems to be something that's not ignored. I'm not saying that people do it out of spite, but there just seems to be a very low lack of support for that. And with that, there is a lot of, you know, different stuff and people who aren't, you know, generally sort of practice. They're not, they haven't gone through like medical school. They they have different sort of treatments. I'm trying to, <laughs> oh, I'm messing my words up there. <laughs> um, what I'm trying to say is uh, what were the sort of alternative treatments that you've explored? What, what helped, what didn't, you know, the kind of stuff that wasn't a part of the, the general medical system. Yeah, so, you know, the, the first thing we did was we just looked around to see what else there was, and we tried all sorts of things. So there's one thing we tried called um, radionics, which is an unusual thing where you um, connect with somebody remotely by Skype or something, and they do oh, wow. something like energy work on the child, and, and um, you know, it wasn't really that clear what was happening, but it was interesting that after each session, there was a, some sort of change in him for a while in that, you know, he might wake up after one of those sessions and, and just feel a little bit brighter, a little bit happier or something. So the, don't know how it worked, but there was some there was something there. We tried homeopathy. It, it didn't seem to have any effect whatsoever in our case. Other, other families have found otherwise, but for us, it didn't seem to work at all. I think the thing that probably had the most effect of all the things that we tried in those very early days was um, cranial osteopathy, which is, you know, it's it's a particular type of osteopathy where the the specialist puts their hands on the body um, in certain places and in certain ways. And he seemed to respond to that more than to to any of the other things. But none of the things that we tried in the early days were things that were going to make a profound difference to his experience of life and his quality of life which is why we kept looking it's more of more of kind of a short-term thing rather than a a long-term a long-term thing which is what you needed yes and what you weren't getting yeah i, I completely get that I, I think you touched on a little bit about how it was good for you know his sleep and his anxiety but not much to do with general well-being yeah i mean anxiety yes it would have been you know if it if it had been a profound cure for anxiety that would have probably have solved everything but actually it did seem to soothe anxiety for a while and then a few hours or days or whatever later it would be back as it was before who knows it might have had a long-term effect if we carried on plowing ahead with that it might have it might have worked you can never tell but our experience of it wasn't you know it was good and we we still go for um cranial osteopathy sometimes because it's sometimes helpful in, in a tight spot but yeah not as a not as a sole approach to improving quality of life I wouldn't have thought and when you were when you were looking for these alternative treatments you were definitely looking for something a lot more long term something that really stood out to you and yeah why why did you go ahead and choose the Mifni Center over all the other organizations be it good or ethically bad um i think precisely for that reason because we wanted something that would really address the reasons why he was feeling unhappy and why he was feeling the need to withdraw and you know it was a bit of a leap in the dark because we didn't know that much about it a lot of the reason we went was because my wife and i both had an intuitive feeling that it was the right thing to do 
you know, there wasn't a lot of information on their website. We connected with another family that went and found out a, a, a bit about how they work, but we didn't know that much. And it was a very big leap in the dark because it was so expensive. And, you know, we had to beg, borrow, and not necessarily steal, but do everything we could to get money to go there. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> you know, so we knew that if it didn't work out, then we wouldn't have the means to try anything else. So it was a it was a really big step, but it was one that without really knowing why we felt very sure about, and, and we were we were actually quite pleased in the end that it's what we did. But it wasn't at all certain that it was going to work out before we went. And there were you know friends and family going, "What are you doing? Why are you putting so much money into this? You don't know anything about it. It could just be some some you know just another snake oil salesman like so many other things that are out there." Yeah, and it's so far away, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, Israel. Yeah, it's not just Israel. It's sort of you you have to get to fly to Israel and then it's, you know, it's uh can't remember three or four hours by car to get to the place and it's a, it's a village on the other side of the country. And definitely yeah, the Daniel obviously probably didn't like all of that then. <laughs> I can imagine. No, actually we 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 um we thought we'd make a bit of a holiday of it. And we had a few days of Tel Aviv. We went to a hotel in Tel Aviv. And it was, you know, it was terrible <laughs> because, you know, he was in a different place. Um, he wasn't happy with, you know, the, the temperature there. It was like, you know, very much hotter than England, which isn't difficult at all. He, he just became very unsettled and very unhappy there. So it wasn't much of a holiday. Yeah, he wasn't happy with that, that part of it at all. So what, what difficulties did you have with the, the whole Mifni approach initially? Now, what, what did you sort of second guess a little bit what was what was the main sort of problems that got in the way of getting the the most out of the treatment i i'm not sure there were any because we'd sort of decided we were going to really give it a full go um and also you know we'd put all our eggs in one basket so we had to give it a full go so we were very trustful of whatever they told us would be the best thing to do there was nothing they said that didn't feel right. Probably the thing that was hardest was that on one of the very early days, we needed to both of us go out of the room and leave him with the ther- with one of the therapists. So without a parent, and it would have been his probably his first time in his life without a parent. And that seemed like a really big step to take, and we really weren't sure of it. So that was probably the, the one thing where we thought, hang on, I'm not sure I want to go ahead with this. But we did. We did go ahead in the end. And he did find it very difficult. But it turned out that that was an important part of, of the process. Mm-hmm. And just even before getting to the Mifni Center, uh, you said you touched on a little bit about get actually walking up that long flight of stairs or that long hill. Yeah. What was that like? Because they... they they sort of gave you some guidance on how to. So you mean the where so, we, we, so they they put us up in a house which was about a ten minute walk away from the centre, and every day we needed to walk um, to the centre, and that was part of the part of the treatment walking up that hill. I, is this what you mean, Thomas? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> so he'd been he'd been very much used to going everywhere in his push chair. He didn't really like to walk. He liked to be carried and and things like this. So, but they told us, you know, it's going to be really helpful for him to 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 sort of work towards slowly towards independence, work slowly towards being trustful that he can do things that he doesn't believe he can do for him to walk there. So we needed to encourage him to walk. We used to walk with him up the hill every morning. And, he, you know, there were a lot of stops and a lot of tears on the first couple of mornings. Um, he didn't like it at all. And again, that was another time, I guess, when we were thinking, are we doing the right thing here? Are we pushing him in a way that that isn't right, that isn't respectful of him? But by the end of the time there, you know, actually probably by the end of the first week, he was sort of, you know, proudly marching up the hill by himself. This whole thing had given him this sense of confidence and happiness. And so that reassured us as well that that we were doing the right thing. So... The Mifni Centre has a few sort of main tenants, containment, offering interaction, you know, reassurance, space and acknowledgement. Could you 
just give us a, a brief overview of what those mean. Maybe give some examples of how they enacted those tenants. Well, I think that the main one was containment. And I think that that probably encompasses all of the other things that you mentioned. And contain- my understanding of containment, it, and it's it's a really, really important concept. And it's one that we, we use a lot and we talk about a lot in the charity as well. And, you know, that we've got articles about containment and it, it, it sort of runs through not only how we want to be helping autistic children, but how we want to work as a team together as well and be containing of each other. In its simplest form, it's the idea that everything's okay, that whatever happens, everything's okay. Whatever happens, I can cope with it. Whatever happens, things will be all right. I think that message, that conviction is something that every human being could would you know is is the most valuable thing for anybody it's the one thing that can reduce anybody's anxiety and the question is how do we use that with children how do we give children that sense that everything's okay and what we learned was you can't do it by explaining anything you can't do it by you know telling or showing the child what they should be doing or how they should be thinking or feeling you can only do it by embodying it yourself because the child will tune into that you know every child looks to their parent as a sort of barometer of how safe the world is how safe things are around them and if they find that their parent is stressed the message they take from that is wow there's something to be stressed about here this is a serious situation there's a crisis going on and if they look at their parent who's stressed who's who's calm who really understands that, who really feels and believes that everything's okay and there's nothing to worry about and that things are going to turn out okay. Children can easily tune into that from their parents and children will therefore understand and take the natural lesson and trust that that's how things are. And it works on such simple levels like, you know, some time ago I was just walking nearby with my son and he fell down and scratched his knee and he started screaming like it was the end of the world. And I just laughed warmly with him. And it sort of calmed him down almost instantly because he could be, oh, well, actually, there's no problem here. Whereas if I'd gone, oh, my God, Daniel, you, you've cut your knee. What are you going to do about it? Then he would, that would, his sense of terror that something unmanageable had happened would only be reinforced. And he would go, more, he probably, it would probably lead him to a meltdown. So, yeah, it's, it's really about embodying in ourselves that everything's okay. And giving that as a cue to the children and they pick up on it. And there, there are, you know, it, it comes up in so many um, aspects of life. Um, but some of the other things you mentioned as well, as well um, you said uh, about um, offering interaction. So this was about, for example, if, if he seemed like he just wasn't interested in interacting in any way, um, instead of pressuring him, instead of having an expectation I need you to interact with me or I have an agenda that you should interact with me, which will not make him feel comfortable and it will only increase his resistance as it does for anybody. Instead, we would not pressure him at all. We would offer um, an offer in a very gentle way and offer with the understanding that the decision is whether he interacts or not is with him. And it's fine either way. Our job isn't to force him to interact, but it's to make that available to him and make it interesting for him if he wants to. So we might do something like sit in the corner of the room with one of his favourite books and start reading it out loud to ourselves, you know, and maybe look up at him occasionally as a, as a way of saying, you, you can join me if you want, but it's fine if you don't want to. And most of the time, if we did something like that, he would sort of keep, he would tentatively peek up. And then within about, you know, within less than a couple of minutes, He'd be sort of right there sitting by sitting by our side or sitting in our lap, following the book, listening to the story. It's just about doing things in, in really light and simple and non-pressured ways instead of using a sledgehammer to invite children to do things. And that, that is massive. That is very, from what I've seen with a lot of the diff, other autism organisations, it's very different in a sense that you do have that 
offering and containment and reinsurance rather than do this or you get punished or do this or you get it's very it seems to be very ethical in comparison to a lot of the the other sort of treatments that I've looked at well I think so I, I think so and it's you know we're, we're really passionate about that actually and it's like we've got a number of um, therapists on our team volunteer therapists and they're, they're really great but we'll only take therapists who really subscribed this this what's known as a more developmental way of um, helping children as opposed to a, um, what's what's known as a, a behavioral way which is about trying to get a child to fit into a to uh, an image that we have of how they should be Con- control and mold, mold yeah. them into something that the parents will find easier or find better yeah, because as well as being counterproductive, that's also, um, I think you said, really disrespectful. It can be sometimes be quite cruel as well. It can be really cruel. And a lot of people, a lot of autistic people who've been through that sort of behavioural therapy really feel when they get to adulthood that, it, that, it's, that it's violated them in some way, that it's, it's not respected them as individuals and, and tried to force a way of behavior on them which which isn't which doesn't match with their natural way of being it's just it doesn't teach them skills to be independent and do their own thing and grow it's just a set set number of things that they have to do and if they do that then yeah i I can imagine and um i was very surprised about you know reading about it in the book yeah how long how long did you go to the mithni center for can i ask three weeks three weeks so although that that is quite that's a good amount of time. Yeah. What what I didn't say about the centre is that, you know, it's three weeks, but it's very, very intensive because the whole centre treats one family at a time only. So, you know, they have sort of five or six therapists I think were working with Daniel and it was just him. It was just and it wasn't only working with Daniel, it was working with us as a family, because they see it very much as a as a whole family affair rather than just an issue with a child, which it isn't. Well, that's great. That is, <laughs> I, can't, I can't imagine um, how beneficial that would be. I mean, I can imagine a little bit because I've read it. But <laughs> <laughs> um, how did you incorporate those those teachings, those aspects of the Mifni Center into your daily life? In the beginning, it was it was in a very structured way, because you know, whereas what the way it had worked in the center in Israel is that he'd. He'd been in a room for six, seven, eight hours a day with with a therapist, one to one. With you know, they they changed the therapist every hour or so. We needed to replicate that as much as we could when we got home. So it was it was a very very exhausting thing to have to do. But you know, I did maybe an hour before work and an hour after work, uh, and my wife did some hours during the day. And we had a therapist who came in a couple of times a week or maybe a bit more at the beginning to fill in some of the gaps as well so it was um it was really really intense at the beginning but as time went on as he started to go to nursery we reduced the hours a little bit as he started to as he started to come out of himself a lot more we gradually expanded the whole thing so it wasn't just him in the room you know it was happening all over the house and so it was less structured the whole idea is that you have that very control controlled in the sense of it being um, fixed in one room. You have that very specific situation for a time, but the purpose of it is so that the child feels safe to come out uh, of that and, and expand their, their horizons, I guess, in terms of, in terms of the, the types of environment where they're able to feel good. Expand the bubble out. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, so it sort of spread to the house. By the time he was five, we weren't doing anything in the room anymore. But after that long of, of putting the, the, the treatment into practice by ourselves, it had sort of been incorporated into us. Were, were there any other sort of resources that you, you um, drawed upon uh, after the Mifni Centre? I, I know you talked a little bit about the Davis Method. Could you get, could you... Give us an idea of what that was. Yeah, the Davis method, it's another, I mean, it's another one that we really like in that it's about helping autistic, actually it works more with autistic adults 
in fact, but it, but they do work on children from around the age of five or six. How, how I don't know how how would they, they the, the language that they would use to put it I think would be to interiorize concepts things it might be it might be things as simple or as profound as con- as, as uh, concepts of the self and the other. There are many people who don't perceive. I mean, on an intellectual level, yes, but don't have that sort of inner understanding of the boundaries between different individuals. Mm. And that's that's to do with mind blindness, isn't it? Like, I think there's a concept that that's quite you know known about in the diagnosis and un- psychological understanding of autism is, is that is very hard for autistic children and sometimes autistic adults to empathize and not emp- not empathize, but put themselves in someone else's shoes and view the world from their angle. Yeah, I think so. I mean, that's that's um, Simon Baron Cohen's uh, concept, isn't it? The mind blindness one. And I, I, to be honest, I don't know enough about it to be able to say whether it's the same as the, as the one suggested by the, the Davis method, but it does sound like it's very similar. And the way that the the Davis, Ron Davis, actually, who's the, the he founded the Davis method, he's um, he's autistic himself. He suggests that this this non-distinction between the self and the other comes from this. It's a really spiritual thing, actually, a sense of interconnectedness of all things and all beings that he has experienced himself very profoundly. But it's a it's a it's a way of without losing that sense of interconnectedness to be able to distinguish between the self and the other in in daily life. Um, But that's just a starting point. It goes through a whole load of other things about time and sequence and they've got a whole load of other things we had a really really good therapist we were working with but she was in germany and the distance piece of it didn't work that well and and so and also daniel was one of the youngest people who'd ever been been through that so i think it was it didn't work so well for him on that concept level but i can certainly see the potential on it if we if we found somebody who was really really good at working working through it with him here but what they also have the um, with the Davis method, it's a, it's a little they've invented a little machine called a Noit. Oh yes, yeah, I remember. I remember you saying something about that in the book. It's very that sounds very interesting. Yeah, there's some huge acronym for it, which I'm afraid I don't know. But it's um, it's a really int- it's a really um, uh, interesting thing. It's a, it's a little device that is placed between his shoulders and it emits a sound to each of his ears at the same time. And this sound has an orientation quality to it. So it's, all it is, it's just a ding sound going on every few seconds. And what we found when we when he started to wear that was that it did sort of um, give him that sort of sense of orientation because one of, the, one of his issues was that he was really, really disoriented. You know, he'd go out, he wouldn't really know where he was. He'd be looking around, he'd be sort of confused and lost quite often. Sounds like me. Well, I mean, I, I think <laughs> it sounds like me too, but I, I mean, I think it's, um, you know, it's quite common in autism for that to be the case. It's, yeah. Or for the fairies. Yeah. <laughs> and it sort of did work to, to sort of, to, to sort of orient him at, at those times when he needed to be oriented. Hmm. So that was a really useful thing. We did things like music therapy, which again, you know, uh, I, I really like music therapy and I, I couldn't, I couldn't do justice to it if I tried to articulate sort of how it works. But when you talk to the music therapists, you know, I'm, I'm always sort of awed by sort of their depth of understanding of how to, to connect with the child. And you see them working with the child and see them using music to, to, you know, really just reach them and make a connection with them and get them to get them to feel good about themselves and wanting to share something and wanting to participate in, in a joint venture. It's a really nice thing. I really like music therapy. Horse riding, we did. You know, he, he learned horse riding a little bit, which, which he really liked. He really connected with the horses. Um, that's quite a grounding thing. And he goes to a little children's gym where he sort of does, you know, exercises for his balance. And they're sort of really good as well. And they're sort of quite grounding and orienting as well. So there's some of the things that we've been trying since Isra. But you know, obviously our main focus has been on the on the, the principles of the Mifni therapy and exp- and you know expanding that as he gets older or adapting it. But these are these are additional things that have been really helpful as well. 
That's brilliant. So the music therapy, did that help with the, did that help a lot with the anxiety? Or was that more of a, did that help more with the connection and sort of sharing experiences part of development? I think and with all with all of these things that I've just mentioned, it's difficult to say with any of them, this is for X or this is for mm-hmm. Y. It's, again, it's an intuitive thing. It's just a real, you know, watching him take part in them. It's a real sense that he, that they're doing him good, basically, because you, you see how he's interacting, how he's relating with them. And yes, okay, it doesn't necessarily make any noticeable difference in daily life, but it's an experience that's a very connecting um, and positive experience for him and, and one that, you know, you make a judgment can only do him good. Wow. Well, I've, I've never, I've heard a little bit about music therapy, but I've never heard of that NOIT. It's uh, N-O-I-T for anybody who's interested. Does it work with adults or is it just for just for children? So what it was actually designed for was for non-verbal autistic people, adults and children. And it promotes the orientation that enables speech to develop. So people of, people use it most often to uh, to promote speech. Hmm. I'll have to I'll have to give it a bit more look after the uh, after you speak. Very interesting. Did you have a few schools in mind when you were? Because obviously the whole choosing schools is a very you know a difficult process for anybody. But when you when you have a child who you know has special needs if they, they have different needs it's obviously quite hard to find somewhere that you'll feel comfortable with and obviously with the distance as well so how did you get around that how did you find somewhere that was good for Daniel well <laughs> and we live in, a, in an area where the schools aren't necessarily the, the ones that parents would most desire I guess and you know, so first of all I guess you've got the you've got the question do you go for a mainstream school or an autism school? And, you know, there's, you, that's a huge decision to make in itself. And we, we decided at that time that we wanted to try him in a mainstream school because he, he did, you know, through the treatment that we were doing with him, he seemed to be going from strength to strength. It was a big step for him and a big challenge for him, but it seemed like it was something that would, he would adapt to and, and he would enjoy. And there was a new school opening in our area, which is one of these these free schools that had a you know very different ethos, and we, we sort of really liked the the thinking behind it. So we enrolled him in that school, and he did. You know, at the beginning it was a shock. You know, the, there were you know hundreds of people in one place. It was very busy. There were a big class of thirty children. So he was, you know, at the beginning he was quite thrown by it. His um, academic work was pretty far behind all of the others actually it's way behind but over time over the first couple of years he really I mean his attitude to it was amazing he was really determined to make it work he loved going to his school he really felt good there and you know within a couple of years his academic work had caught up with everybody else and it was actually starting to excel it was starting to to be really quite uh, exceptional so yes it was a good start in the new school what happened then though there was a there was an issue of bullying unfortunately when he got to about seven years old and you know the other children may not have realized that it was bullying but it was you know as far as they were concerned it was a a case of they found a way to to get what they considered to be a funny reaction out of him and they kept pressing that button and every time they pressed it it was it was an extra element of trauma for Daniel and after quite a long time of this it it just became too much for him so he went through quite a serious regression at that time and he became really disoriented you know all of the gains that he'd made since starting school they all just totally reversed actually and he wasn't able to to really be in that situation anymore He, he was still adamant that he wanted to go to school every day but when he was there, he was totally disoriented and it can't have been doing him any good. So we moved him to an autism school and he's actually he's actually been doing a lot better there. You know, it took a long time for him to get his confidence back, actually. And, you know, 
the knockbacks that he received during that that bullying period you can still see the effects of them now you know there's still he has a high much higher level of anxiety now and fears than he had before that happened around other people around like in social interactions not not only not necessarily only in that sense it's it's almost like it's transmuted into a, a sense that the world is not safe and so everything is not safe yeah well, i can imagine that that's quite contrary to the idea of containment i suppose yeah totally because if you go in every day to a school and you you know that what well, you expect to be to have a negative experience there it's obviously going to affect him quite a lot isn't it yeah and you know it, it's it does and it, it and like you say it's the opposite of containment and whereas containment is about bringing about trust bringing about confidence bringing about that you know that sort of sense of joy in life the bullying did the opposite of all of those things and so he's now carrying a lot of of anxiety and a, a lot of fears which you know we're working with as, as best we can um, just in our family but um, yeah, it's it's a real shame. It's a real shame because, you know, parents have to make this choice. Do you go to a mainstream school, which will give the child exposure to the world that they're going to have to live in when they get older? And, you know, the idea is the thinking that we had was, well, that will make him much more resilient in the future, as opposed to a special school where it's a protected environment and you don't have the, the, the exposure to that. However, the other the flip side of it is, that in a mainstream school, everybody knows that children can be exceptionally cruel. And, you know, that can happen. And it did happen to the extent that it undermines and makes impossible that aim of getting that exposure to increase resilience and comfort and, and, and happiness in, in, the, in the world that you'll have to live in. I suppose there is a, you know, there's, there is a dilemma because there, there are benefits and downsides to, to both of them. And I suppose it, it would be very dependent on how their child is experiencing school. I had an absolute horrific time during school. I was very good at primary school. I got along with got along with people well. I was very I was I was okay. I felt good. I was all happy. Uh, I think the main thing for me was secondary school. And that's when, you know, I sort of wished that I had somewhere to go to that wasn't there. So it was just horrific, you know, from everywhere, lots of different sources of bullying, lots of different, especially when you grow a bit older, you know, there's there's other stuff coming into play like hormones and different social dynamics and groups. And everyone seems to be pushing forward in this sort of social world that you don't really know about. And that was the main, the main thing for me. And you knew you were autistic at that time? I did. So I was diagnosed when I was 10. And was there any support in the school? Uh, I had somewhere to go to and I had someone someone to talk to if I needed it, which was nice. But no very specialist support. There was no one there who really sort of... And no adaptations, I guess, of, of school life. Yeah. You know, when, you, when you're at that age, you, you want to try and be strong and the, the cool person. And the, you, you don't... I didn't want at that time to be having such intensive support. And I, I even shunned quite a lot of the support that I was getting for my mental health because I just didn't want to talk to people about it. But I think probably that was a symptom of just not feeling safe with people. And I guess being able to catch that in in your son was, was probably a very good good thing to do. And I, I would have probably made the same sort of you know, same sort of decisions that you have. Well, you know, we got to the point where it was like, if if this can happen when he's six, what's going to happen when he's 12? What's going to happen when he's 15? Yeah, definitely. You know, and, and you think if you're going to make, if it, if you are going to choose to put your child in a mainstream school, it's so important to to be really, really clear about what the school can do. Because the school that my son went to, they were, they were, they had every intention of being very supportive, but they didn't have any understanding of autism, any specialist understanding of autism. And so they wouldn't necessarily have picked up on the signs that there was something wrong for Daniel. 
Um, and even when we brought it to their attention, it, it didn't necessarily seem like anything to worry about from their point of view. They thought we were being overprotective parents. So, you know, they were really keen to get to, to sort of, you know, do what they could and provide whatever support that they could. But without that real understanding and that real commitment to making adaptations for the child that are based on that understanding and being able to notice preemptively what's going on for a child and to step in when it's when it's when the child needs it and probably doesn't even know that they need it or like you do, doesn't want to take it that's that's critical it's really critical if it's going to be a success and we, we do the rates of bullying and social isolation especially in school is ridiculously high rates of you know severe mental health conditions as i've said and i think a lot of that is to do with mainstream schools i don't regret going to a mainstream school now that i'm older in some ways if it, if i was in a, a different school if i was in a if i was surrounded by different people it would be good if i sound surrounded by nice people but just because the nature of the school that i went to and um, we had a lot of people who were just you know very toxic and very willing to pick pick on people who weren't able to defend themselves and it's 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 a hard one isn't it yeah it is i i'm not sure you know whether whether one option is better than the other i just think it depends on as you've said whether they have the resources there in the mainstream schools and whether they are getting on because primary school was good for me mainstream secondary school not not too great yeah well i mean exactly for that reason it needs to be a, a really dynamic thing as well so it needs to be monitored all the time and you might need to switch from one from one to the other as we did but do you do you find that what you went through at school does that have any lasting impact on you now does that you know is that a factor in you know how you are as a person now or have you managed to to fully overcome it by now do you think uh it's it's always hard to know i think a lot of the difficulties that i have it's never been autism that's been the problem for me it's it's always been my mental health and it's it's hard to know whether it's just ingrained on me it's just biological that i just have like a lower serotonin or i have higher anxiety or just it's it's very hard to tell whether my experiences at school really was was the cause of my mental health nowadays. Yeah. But I do definitely think that it had a long-standing effect on my mental health. And uh, although I'm pretty much over that hump, I still have, you know, remnants of it and possibly, you know, a little bit of insecurity, high levels of anxiety. It's hard to know what I would be like if I wasn't at a mainstream school, but I'm very happy with how I am now. I did a lot. I have a good social life now. I've I've done well at sport. I've, you know, gone to university and, and traveled and stuff. And whether that's because of mainstream school, I don't know. But I think in general, even if you are at a you know autism specialist school or a special needs school, getting getting that sort of contained exposure as you as you said would be ideal for me. It's just a assumption, but I think that that would be better for me when I was when I was younger. But I'm not. I'm. I don't regress it at all because it's you know it's over now. Can move on with it. I have experience of it, and now I can sort of help other people make the right decisions for their children or for themselves. And yeah, it's all good. It's all good now. And do things like podcasts. Indeed, yes. <laughs> Even though I'm trying to get the hang of it. <laughs> <laughs> But anyway, at the end of your book, you boil down your experiences and learning process into five key things for other parents to learn from. Can you talk a little bit about these? Well, containment is one. We've talked about that a lot. And a lot of the book, you know, containment is a theme that runs really heavily through the book because it's so central to giving the best opportunities to a child or, or to actually any, any person. Uh, one of them was to respect the child. Obviously, it's not helpful to anybody to see uh, a child as having limitations or as having problems. Look at him as a human being or her 
and see what what's there within that person and the things that you find difficult well maybe the difficulty is how we're looking at them and how we're responding to them and how we're perceiving them maybe those things have got a flip side that are amazing which we're just choosing not to look at so it's really respecting the child by 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 valuing everything about who they are one of them was about patience and just having patience because some of the things that you do to help your child will not seem to bear fruit for a long time and it's a question of really again I talked about intuition a lot, but really tuning into your intuition and finding out is what I'm doing helpful. Is if it is, keep doing it and 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 wait for the response. You know, and it might just be uh, one of the things I think I mentioned in the book is that sometimes it's just it might just be a number of days and you'll get some sort of great response from trying something to help your child. But during those days, it feels like nothing's happening. It's it, it's it's an eternity. It's going on forever. It's clearly not working. So, so that's where the patience thing comes from. And the trust as well. Another one of them is trust. And, and, and that's about really having faith that your child knows what's best for them and that your child is going to take the best of any of the good experiences that you give them. You know, it's almost trust that you don't need to step in and do everything for the child. Um, you don't need to be overprotective because at the end of the day, that's going to make the child less confident, more dependent. And the last one is looking after looking after yourself as a parent, because, you know, for us, it was unbelievably draining because of the path we'd chosen, because it was so intensive. For other families, it's unbelievably draining because they don't have a path like that. And they're dealing with meltdowns for years and years and years on end. And they have no idea how best to to, to support their children so it's about being compassionate to yourself as a parent and about not being demanding not feeling guilty it's so easy to feel I'm not doing enough it's so easy to feel well look I'm going flat out and I'm killing myself but it's obviously not enough because he's still suffering or she's still suffering and it's really about cutting yourself some slack and being satisfied that you can only do your best and if you push yourself beyond your best it's going to be counterproductive because it's going to take away your capacity to help your child. It's going to leave them with less help because you're spending too much of your time beating yourself up when that energy should be diverted to doing the best that you can, whatever that is, however limited that is to help your child. Brilliant. I couldn't have said it better myself. That is a nice little list list of things to take away from this podcast. It's been really great to talk to you, Guy. If you want to check out Guy's book, and the organization. I will put the link, both of these in the description on my podcast. Uh, it's available on Spotify. I'll put it on YouTube and it's available on a lot of different sort of audio platforms. So if you just check the description down there, you'll be able to find them. Uh, is there any other sort of social medias or links that you want to put out? Um, the website is transformingautism.org. Uh, O-R-G, and I don't know all of the social links, but they're in the top right-hand corner, they should be. Uh, links to the, the Twitter and Facebook and LinkedIn and all of those things. Brilliant. Uh, I'll try and put those down in the description as well. Perfect. Brilliant. Uh, thank you so much for coming on, talking about your book. If any of you have enjoyed the podcast, make sure to tell your friends, share it, and consider heading over to my YouTube channel, Asperger's Growth, where I talk about mental health, autism, self-help, all of that good stuff. If you have any ideas of who you want on the next episode or a sort of a future episode, or you have an amazing story or accolade you want to talk about yourself, you can contact me at my email, aspergisgrowth at gmail.com. With all that said and done, Guy, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. Did you enjoy it? Certainly did. Brilliant. Thanks so much for listening and I'll see you all in the next couple of weeks where I'll talk to the founder of Chewy Gem, a sensory items company for autistics. I'm Thomas Henley and this has been the 40 Audi podcast. Thank you for listening. See you later.